board now. So you've just turned in homework number three, uh, sorry, two. And homework three is going to be a due a week from today. And uh, there's mostly problems on there that you should solve using Microsoft Excel. Uh, there are a couple of them that if you choose to solve it with, by hand, you can. And so, you know, if you have a mixed solution where some of your work is done by hand, and some of it is done by Excel, then you need to upload both to Blackboard before the 4 o'clock deadline. Um, is just the Excel column part, or do you want us to like submit our answers like on a PDF or something so you can quickly view the answer and then look at the Excel PDF? That's a good question. Um, I can see the Excel file pretty quickly. But what you should do is you should really highlight and bold and maybe, uh, you know, um, turn it yellow, the final answer, because each of you will have slightly different formatting on your Excel spreadsheets. And so if the question is asking, you know, what is the present value, don't make me go hunting on the spreadsheet to find that. So I'm glad you asked, because I think there is a lot you can do to make the answer stand out, you know, whether it's making the final answer bold text or highlighting the cells yellow or, you know, drawing arrows, but it doesn't have to be a PDF of the spreadsheet. Next Tuesday, uh, I'm going to be telling you about the first project for the course. And that's an optimization project that you can use Microsoft Excel to solve. And you'll have, a, I think, two or three weeks to solve that project. Um, so that'll definitely be a good class to be here for. So I'm going to give you the background, and uh, we'll talk about it in a lot of detail then. So any concerns or questions before we start talking about the spreadsheet functions? Well, let me give you, actually, I printed out the next homework assignment. I have paper copies of that for you, and it's also posted on Blackboard so that if you misplace this paper copy, it's available for you. <clears throat> All right. Now, let's review the concept of balance. I showed you the picture of an elephant standing on a ball picture of these balancing rocks. And so in our last class on Tuesday, I mentioned the idea between balance in inflows and outflows. And more specifically, if there's a balance between the present value of the inflows and the outflows, um, then that indicates that you've solved for the rate of return. So there's some interest rate that makes everything in equilibrium or balance. And a lot of what we'll be doing this semester is solving for the rate of return on a project. And so I wanted to revisit the approach that is you need to discount future amounts to the present. And then there's already going to be some other amounts that are likely at the present already. And more typically, those are the, um, the project initialization costs. So equipment purchase, mobilization, acquisition of some investment. All of the expenses and outflows that you experience at time zero have to be justified by some future revenues. And what you're trying to determine is when you have an estimate of what those future revenues will be, you're trying to find out what's the equivalent rate of return. So I wanted to review that concept because your exam, uh, your exams are going to have a balance of some concept questions where you're having to write a short answer and explain an idea. And there's also some problem solving. And this is a concept that I think is important for you to be able to explain. OK. Now, last time we already jumped a little bit into the spreadsheets. I did a demonstration to show you uh, how to use the built-in PV function. And so just to revisit that idea, once you start putting in the equals sign, and that tells Microsoft Excel that you're putting in a function. And PV, it kind of automatically brings up the catalog of all of the built-in functions that start with the letter P when you type the letter P and then V. Um, this parentheses, though, is when you start to see, like in bold, beneath the formula with the prompts of what 
needs to be in each cell. And you're so fortunate to have that. I'm so ancient that I remember using spreadsheets when you kind of just had to remember what went into the cells. And there was no on-screen prompt. I mean, I guess you could go into the program documentation, but it's nice that I'll start up Excel here since we're going to use it today. It's nice that once you begin typing the formula, it guides you and gives you these little hints of what data it needs to see. So for example, equals PV and then the parentheses. It tells you rate, for example, and obviously that's where you're putting in the interest rate as a decimal, not as a whole number. And then the next field for NPER, number of periods. Now, what I've suggested to you so far is that we're typically going to skip over the payment field. And I'll illustrate for you today why we do that. But this double comma that's in this example format, the double comma is because the payment is what would go into the third field. And a payment is a, a uniform series. When Excel says PMT, it's asking you to, to tell it the magnitude of a uniform annual series that has n payments of it. So if instead what you're doing is you're trying to translate just a single lump sum value to the present, then you should put that single lump sum value in the FB field. And of course the, the minus sign for the reasons that we've talked about before. So interest rate is a decimal, the number of periods, which may be years, it may be months, you know, whatever the period duration is, Excel is just talking about periods. We use the double commas to skip over the payment field. Um, and it assumes the sign change, and so we have to manually override that. Okay, so this is an in-class exercise question that if we wanted to, we could solve this by hand. You know, we could find the 7% table. And by the way, I've loaded compound interest tables into Blackboard. So there's a PDF file there for you to use on the homework assignment where um, it has the different factor tables for you know half a percent interest, one percent interest, two percent, and so on. So we could go on to Blackboard, find the compound interest table for seven percent, and we could, for example, think about the steps. If you've got an annual series here and we're trying to find the overall present value, we would find the present equivalent in year one, and then we'd move it from one to zero. And then here's another annual series, which we would find the lump sum equivalent in year seven, and then move it from seven to zero. And then here we just have some isolated individual amounts, which we would discount to the present with find P given F factors. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps, and we could do it by hand. Um, but we can also do it with Excel, and the advantage there, besides not having to use our calculator, is that then we can make adjustments if we need to. For example, if we want to change it from 7% to 6%, we can make those adjustments, and it all happens very quickly. So let's do that. Let's open up Excel and translate the cash flow diagram into a cash flow table and then solve this to find out what is the present value. So I see everybody has a, a computer today. That's good. Now I'll ask you a favor. If you need me to repeat something, don't be shy. So that's the favor. Let me know if you're hung up on something because it's really easy for me to demonstrate it a second time or come around and, uh, and look on your screen. But um, I can't know to do that unless you tell me. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is define our interest rate. So I equals, and for this problem it's 7%, so 0 0.07. And then we're going to have a uh, part of this where we say the year. So year, amount, and PV of amount. All right. Now this one goes through 16 years. So we want to have our year starting at zero and all the way down through 16. OK. 
Okay? And now type the amounts, and I'm going to pause for a moment, and I'm just going to have you independently work where you're using that PV formula. And remember, at the bottom, we're going to have to find the sum of all the PVs of the amounts. And so that field here is going to be where we find out the present value of the entire cash flow diagram. So let me circulate around and see if you've got any questions. But translate this, the amounts that are shown here, into this column. And then use the equals PV function in this column. And let's find out what's the sum of the present values. Yeah, what I did is I just typed one, 0 and 1. And then once you've got two of them typed, see there's like it's a little bit thicker, that green. I'm going to click on that and hold down my mouse cursor and drag down. And you can see faintly off to the right, it tells you what the number is going to be. So I go all the way down through 16. And then when I let go, it's filled it all in. So it saves you the trouble of having to type it. Yep, because there's no money there yet. All right, so the answer should be seventy-eight thousand two hundred and sixty and fifty-five cents. Okay, so remember, if you if you don't uh, have a preference, I'd suggest using this currency formatting. I think the currency formatting makes the most sense, but if you prefer something else, that's okay. So are there any follow-up questions on this first problem from the in-class exercise? OK. There's also a function called NPV. And so let's just try using the NPV function. When you apply it, you only apply it to amounts that aren't already at the present. And you don't do it to the PV of the amount. You do it to the amount. So it's a, NPV is a built-in function. And the way it works is you say equals NPV. And you can see it's prompting for the interest rate. So here, I'm just going to click on the 7%. And now, all of the values it's looking for, it wants to know, starting with the amount in year one, you click on the range of values, and then close parentheses. It's automatically going to do the same thing that we've done. It's going to find the PV for each year in that range. And the order of the number in the range, it's assuming the first year should be discounted one, the next entry should be discounted two periods, and so on. So you'll see here it said 78,260. So it's an abbreviated way to calculate the present value. But the disadvantage is you can't quite see the influence of each individual year in the same way that you can if you're doing the full-blown PV of amount column. But I wanted to let you know about that function called the NPV function. So you only include future values in that function. If you had some amount that's already at the present, it shouldn't be included in the NPV function. And that's the number one mistake that I see students making when they apply the NPV function is I want to remind you that when I use the NPV function, I didn't include year zero. So it's just 
say you had a, an amount at year zero, like ten thousand dollars. Yep. But you wanted to find that then, ten thousand dollars plus uh -huh. everything else. Yep. You would find one through sixteen and then add the ten thousand at the end. That's right. Okay. So it would be like plus ten thousand dollars. You'd put that amount that's already at time zero outside of the NPV function. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So that's what we do when we're trying to move things to the present. Now, there is an FV function. You probably already looked at problem two on the handout. The FV function is what we uh, use for that. But there's a trick, though. Um, NPER, the number of periods, when we were working for this, it was just the number of periods was the same as whatever year we're in. So for example, this amount that's here at the end of the first annual series, you see this arrow at, at year five? How many years do we have to discount that to get it to zero? One, two, three, four, five. So it's in year five and the number of periods is five. But what if we wanted to take this arrow at year five, what if we wanted to take it to the future in year 16? what is the number of periods it needs to compound into the future? Well, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So the amount is in year 5, but n is not 5. If you're taking it to the present, you need to think n should be the number of periods to get it to whatever present, I'm, I'm sorry, future. N is the number of periods that you're going to be compounding it to get to whatever future you've got in mind. So that's the tricky thing with the, adver uh, with the FB function. We're same, putting in the minus sign for uh, changing the, um, the sign function where it's assuming an outflow and you need to give it an inflow. We're going to skip over the payment field. But uh, here's our next in-class exercise problem. We're taking this cash flow diagram and we want to find out the lump sum in the future, the equivalent lump sum. Okay, so let me copy this, and this is 8.5%. Let's just create a new workbook. And for your homework problems, that's the best thing to do is you know, put each problem on its own tab. So we'll create a new tab. This was like uh, P1. Oops. You can change the name of it, P1. For today, here's P2, and I'm going to paste the image of our cash flow and the interest rate that we're working with this one, 8.5%. Okay, so first, I equals, and then in a separate cell, 0 0.085. Same columns, well, similar. We've got year, amount, and FV of amount. Where do you open up the new cell? Down here, see the plus? Yeah, new sheet. If you just click on the plus, then that'll add another one. So first step, translate the cash flow diagram into a cash flow table. And we need to go through 16 years, and so we can just uh, have it kind of auto-populate downward. You don't have to type over and over again. If you have like 11,500, you can just click and drag down rather than having to type it over. So like the 15,000, instead of typing it three times, I'll just click and drag like that. Okay, so see if you can figure out this FV function. And once again, once you do, you're going to need to do a sum function at the bottom to find out the total of the FV of each individual amount. So I'm going to just give you one more hint, and I'll ask everybody to look up on the screen, because this is, I think, a good one. Let's add another column. 
So if you just click here and right click, insert, it gives us another column. And so let's have it be years until year 16. Because remember, we need to not have like this 10,000 that's right here. It's not going to move zero years to get to the future. It needs to move 16 years to the future. So like this is going to be a secondary time column. So I'm going to have equals 16 minus whatever row we're on. So it needs to move 16 years to get to the future. And so on and so forth. And so this column is what you're going to use for NPER. This is what goes into the NPER field. What is when, there, when it's asking for the TVs when you're doing an F for every function, what is it supposed to ask you for? That's what you should put the amount. So, for example, this uh, 11,500, this one here in year five. What we're trying to do is we're trying to move it from year five to year six, uh, 16. So, what we're telling it is here's our interest rate. The number of years it should move is 11 years. And then the so-called present value, we're kind of pretending like this is at the present. So we're like, move it from wherever it is 11 years into the future. So like the, the PV field should be whatever the amount is for the row that you're on. So here in the formula, you know, I've been emphasizing the need to put the dollar signs in front of the reference to the interest rate. And, uh, and the reason for that is that it always will look at the interest rate if it's anchored, but otherwise it won't. So if I, if I go down, look at how the formula is changing. The reference to the amount and the years is changing, but the interest rate is staying the same. So like, I only have to type in the equation one time, but then when I drag it downward through the rest of them, it knows always look here for the interest rate, but then everything else is changing based on what row you're in. So if I forgot, what if I forgot to put in the dollar signs? Then what would my answer look like? The first one would be right, but then things would become very strange after that. You know, it would think that there's no interest rate, and then it would start to use 10,000 as the interest rate, and I'd get a crazy number from that. So that's why it's important to make sure that we have this dollar sign in front of the interest rates. All right, so any additional questions on problem two of the exercise? Okay. Now, Here's another one. Let's create another tab down at the bottom, a new sheet, P3. And uh, OK, here's our cash flow diagram. And it says, find the future value in year 16 at 6.25%. That's the first part. But then after that, we're going to play around with the interest rate to find out what interest rate is required to get the future value exactly 100,000. OK, so the first part's just a, a repeat of what we just did. More practice. So we have interest rate. Year amount FB of amount. Yep, problem
so basically n should be negative and p or p v or p negative. Um, so it either means the payment or the future value should have the opposite. So one should be a positive and one should be a negative. Okay. I'm going to demonstrate the part where we iterate to try and find out. So I'm going to write here at 6.25% interest, the sum of the FV is 61,157 and 18 cents. But what interest rate is needed? for the sum of the FV to be 100,000. Okay, so we need to just play around with this interest rate until this sum of the future values is 100,000. So what about 10%? Getting closer, 11%. Getting closer, 15%. Getting nice and close. Rather than just do that manually, typing it over and over again, I'll use data tab and then look for the what if analysis, goal seek, and then the goal is we want to set this target of the sum, so that's in my case D22, to a value of 100,000. And we can tell it by changing the interest rate. So as soon as I click OK, it's going to go through the process of constantly updating this value, which is the interest rate, until the sum is equal to 100,000. We're pretty close already. It's going to still need to take a little bit higher than 16%. So if I click OK, then it finds 17.246% is what interest rate would make the sum of this equal to 100,000. So like this all means, what if you were going to take just a single lump sum payment in year 16 instead of all of these distributed payments over time? If someone was going to give you a lump sum payment and you want to make an interest rate of 17.24%, then the value of those payments, the economic equivalence of it, would be $100,000 in year 16. So this is economically equivalent to these payments over time if this is the interest rate. So let me just circulate. All right. What you've just done with that goal seek is going to be important on the project as well. Because on the project, you're trying to maximize profits. And so you'll be using the solver tool on the project, which we'll talk about in class on Tuesday next week. Um, I think that solves, that finishes up question three on the in-class exercise. And that just leaves us with this last one here how to find an unknown interest rate. So there's a function called rate. And did we talk about this last time? The rate function? No? All right. So um, it will solve an interest rate, and it has to know the number of periods, 
the amount of a recurring payment and then a lump sum present value. But what it's assuming to solve a rate is it's assuming, for example, that you made a deposit and then you're taking withdrawals over time and it will solve for an interest rate. Or it's going to assume the reverse of that, that, for example, you take a loan now and then you have to pay over time. It can only find the rate that balances an inflow and an outflow. So I give you the, um, the note here that the two amounts in each function have to have an opposite sign. So I'm not talking about the n. n is just a whole number. But either your payment has to be negative or the future value needs to be negative. One of those two values needs to be negative when you use the, the rate function. Either the payment or the lump sum needs to be negative. Okay, so this last problem, we've got a cash flow table that basically is just showing uh, you make a payment of 45,000. I'm going to write this on the board. So 45,460. And then there's a revenue coming to you of 7,500. And it happens one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And we want to know what is the interest rate that you're earning if you pay 45,460 today and then you get seven payments of 7,500. What's your, your rate of return for that? So we're going to put it into this function. So we're going to say equals rate. OK. And it wants to know n. So I'll type in the number 7. It's going to want to know the magnitude of the payment. So it's 7,500. I guess I don't, I'm not going to put the dollar sign. It doesn't need to know the currency, just 7,500. And then the PV is negative 45,460. And when we put that in, it will return the interest rate. So I'll just create a new tab for the sake of consistency here. And uh, here's our cash flow table. We don't need to make, we don't have to type in like a cash flow table into Excel. We can use the function just equals rate. OK, so the first thing it's asking, NPER, the number of periods. So there's seven periods. The payment, 7,500. Now, is it a future value that's the lump sum, or is it like a present value that's the lump sum? In our case, it's a present value. so. That's what's bolded right now. So I'm going to say minus 45,460. And that's that. 4%. And if I wanted to show some more precision here, 4.3, I'm sorry, 3.735%. OK. So the rate function is useful. Let me just write a variation of this on the board. Let me write a variation of this on the board. What if the scenario was um, we have a series of revenues, but we don't have to pay it back until the very end. Let's say that there's eight of them, and then in the very end, we have to pay back, OK, so it's uh, $10,000 a year you're taking. And then you have to pay back $100,000. What's the interest rate if you get $10,000 every year for eight years, and then you have to pay back 100000 So like the bank is offering you that. 
but they don't tell you necessarily what's the interest rate that applies. They're just telling you, we'll give you 10,000, eight payments equal consecutive. Okay, so if it is uh, eight equal annual payments you receive of $10,000, followed by a single lump sum payment you give to the bank in year eight. What is the rate of return? Or what is the interest rate? Okay, so we are gonna do equals rate in this new example I post on the whiteboard, there's eight payments. The amount of the payment is 10,000. Okay, now the next field that's highlighted right now is PV. And we're not trying to say that 100,000 is a PV, that's a FV. So we skip over the PV field. So just put in another comma to skip over it. And now it's highlighting FV. So the fu future value is now minus 100,000. And it's going to calculate the effective interest rate here. 6.29%. OK. So the way that this is different from the, the earlier example is just that the 10,000 isn't in the PV field, it's in the FV field. So you have to put in a double comma to skip over the PV. So it should be 6.29%. Well, let me see if you've got a question. Are you looking for longer distance for all your Ah, yeah, so go to home. Similar, equals rate. Mm -hmm. Does anybody in parentheses? Oh, eight, mm -hmm. comma, 10,000, okay. comma. Now we'll skip over the PV, so another comma, mm -hmm. no interest, and then put in yeah, minus 100,000. Okay, and close the parentheses. Do you know how to show more digits than that? Um, I think it's here. That's right, yeah. Another wall, but it's oh, here it goes right to the wall. Okay, does anybody have any questions before we finish for tonight? All right, we've made some good progress. The uh, the homework assignment, I gave you the handout for that. If you look at kinds of problems that are on there, there's a couple of gradient problems. And then on the back side is mostly Excel problems. And so I think you could solve everything on here based on what we've done today. We'll have some additional practice um, using Excel on Tuesday when I introduce the project, but it won't specifically be related to these problems. It's just going to be playing with Excel a little bit more on Tuesday. So I think basically what I'm saying is, Everything that, I, that you need to solve the assignment we've been over in class already. So if you have questions as you're working on it, let me know. I love helping students debug spreadsheets. So if your spreadsheet isn't working and you can't see what is the problem, you can come to my office, call me on Teams, and we'll do a screen share, and I'll look at your spreadsheet. Because I think it's really fun. All right? All right. Have a good weekend. I'll see you next Tuesday.